uh, survey. We just asked that you complete that and turn that in so we can make improvements to this annual conference. And also, uh, CLE certificates will be emailed to you this year instead of the paper. So we should have your email address. If not, you can stop by the front desk up front and they'll make sure we get your email address. And we will email those out in the next couple of days. So uh, we're going to talk about what everybody needs to know about ethics. And specifically, I just call it how to keep your license. So uh, I'm Scott Trout and Barb Johnson Stern, uh, partner, our newest, uh, our newest partners at Cordell, is also going to be joining me and taking the majority of uh, this topic as she prepared all of it. So I want to give her kudos. Uh, I'm just uh, copywriting her work, so or copying off of her work. So ethics, I think one of the things that um, it, can, it can be very boring. That's why we obviously put it last, because uh, there's nothing exciting. We don't have any fun videos. Uh, it's hard to find some videos that would be applicable. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about why I think it's important, uh, what we can learn from it. Uh, I think we want to try to create a little bit of a dialogue going uh, among everyone. We'll probably toss some questions out to everyone. Uh, we, in fact, I know Frank and Barb and I were uh, just talking about one of the ethics rules just out in the lobby, and I think all three of us had a differing opinion, and that's, I think, the interesting thing about ethics, is that we, uh, you'll find everyone in this room may have something different to uh, provide to the topic. And so we, uh, for today's topic, we have taken the uh, information from the 2012 report from the OCDC. The, the issue of annual report 2013 isn't announced yet. Uh, I've also got some numbers from 2011 uh, that we'll go through just to kind of highlight uh, what we're going to be discussing and, and how it applies to each of us and why specifically it applies uh, best to us in family law. So in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in 2012, interesting, there were 2,039 complaints. <coughs> it seems like a lot. But in 2011, there were 2,278. And in 2010, 2,224. So you think about the number, but what I did was, and it's not on the slide, is I looked up how many licensed attorneys there are in Missouri. Anybody have any idea? I, I was I had no idea. Too many. I remember that. 28,000. It's a big number. So. When you take the 28,000 and you look at the number of complaints, it's only about 7.3% of the total number of attorneys. Now that percentage is a little off because obviously some of these complaints you have repeat offenders who are always getting complaints. And I think we all know, uh, we see that. Uh, so it's probably a much smaller percentage than 7.3%. Of the 2,039 complaints, we'll talk a little bit about what happens with those, but 856, a uh, formal investigation was opened, so a real small fraction. So of that, then the OCTC breaks it down, it goes to regional. Uh, of the regional complaints, only 457 of the 856 went to a regional complaint, which represents only about 3.1% of the attorneys are faced with a complaint that is investigated regionally. Of the uh, total 856, approximately 390 go on to the OCDC, representing about 1.4%. So it's interesting as you look, you know, you have these complaints, but only the serious ones and percentages continue to go down. And my guess is that 1.4% is even smaller, maybe even 0.7, less than 1% when you, when you count the repeaters. So it's a small number. 48 were placed into formal resolution program. Uh, which represents less than 1% of the attorneys actually went through a formal resolution program, or 2% of the total complaints actually go to a formal resolution. So, I mean, it's, when you look at statistics and you think about chances, uh, you know, we all fear that complaint and we don't want to uh, deal with it. Uh, it's good news, right? When you kind of look through a little bit more, and I dug a little bit deeper into the report, 12 attorneys in 2012 were disbarred. 12 out of 28,000. Three of those 12, it was only by default. So really we're talking about nine that we know 
did something that was sufficient or worthy of disbarment. 30 of our 28,000 members were suspended, and three of the 28,000 received a public reprimand. So it takes an effort to get disbarred. It takes an effort to have a formal complaint, or it takes ignorance. And so that's why I think the most important thing is that we go through this annually, and we just try to learn something and even communicate and talk about some of the issues because uh, it is a little dicey when it comes to certain issues. We were talking about attorney-client privilege, confidentiality, and what it takes with a waiver. Uh, and there's all kinds of uh, thoughts on that process. So I thought that's why uh, I would talk a little bit about more of the details and more of the statistics. But the good news, like I said, was it's only representative of around 7%. Here's the bad news. Uh, the bad news is that I think all of us in here, it's coming up tax day, April 15th, we all fear being audited by the IRS. So I thought, okay, let me just compare the two. The chances of being audited by the IRS are less than 1%. It's actually 0.008% that you'll actually ever be audited by the IRS. But yet I would bet, if we thought about it, everyone here would mention that, oh, I don't, I don't want to mess with the IRS. Uh, and we give seminars around the country to clients and we talk about uh, financials. We know that they talk about financial statements. And you find clients will raise, if you give them a, a, a choice, what, what do you fear most? The completion of an income and expense statement or an IRS audit? they'll say IRS audit nine times out of 10. But the point is, is that they're gonna be audited in my mind 100% of the time on their income and expense statement. So they really should be more fearful of what they put on their income and expense. Likewise, you should be more fearful of being audited by the OCDC than you would by the IRS. Because we're talking about your livelihood, our ability to practice, our reputation. We'll talk about uh, that because that's one of the areas that you'll see in complaints is candor with the tribunal. Uh, especially in this area, St. Louis, St. Charles, Jefferson County. As I mentioned, if your uh, honesty and candor is in question, you might as well pack it up. I think it's a small enough bar uh, that that matters. Putting aside the fact that it is an ethics complaint that judges can file against you. So, good news, bad news. Good news is a small percentage. Bad news is you're likely, more likely to get an audit, what I'll call an audit, a letter from the regional uh, committee or the OCDC than you are from the IRS. So more details into the numbers. You have 968 of the complaints were never opened. Uh, they were filed with the OCDC and nothing was done with them. They were essentially dismissed on their face as perhaps not involving an ethics complaint or an issue with the rules of professional conduct. 94 needed further review which means they likely fell into the 2013 numbers, so we don't know what that, what happened to those. So it's, but you look at the numbers, it's a rolling number every year. It's probably a consistent percentage of those that need further review before anything is done. 125 had insufficient information, so in reality, they were probably kicked back, give us some more information about what you're complaining about, and then they were pulled back in either to the next year, 2013. Again, probably the same statistical significance. 96 referred to a fee dispute, and it's interesting, I think, at least from my perspective, I always think, well, that's a fee dispute, we don't have to worry about it, we can deal with the you know, BAMSL fee dispute committee. It's not an ethics issue, well, it is. We'll talk a little bit about fees, uh, and why uh, you have to be as concerned about fees as you would uh, diligence, communication, contact with third parties, etc. Uh, 24 were referred to comprehensive resolution, and 27 were held in inquiry status. I call that purgatory. It's kind of like the worst place you can go, right, is purgatory, because you don't know where you're going, you're stuck in this inquiry status. You never want to go there, I'd rather have resolution. You don't want to be in inquiry and, and figuring out what's going to happen to you next. Be kind of the, uh, the terrible position. So, I thought that was interesting as well as you look at the numbers. We all get these, this report, or it's all available to us. And I have never really uh, dug into the report and read through it. I mean, I'm perhaps like any of you, I, you get the uh, Missouri Bar uh, Journal. And I always flip to the back, 
okay, who was suspended this week? Who was disbarred this week? Do I know them? Did I graduate with them, right? I look at their bar number, see where, when they graduated. It's interesting. But I didn't dig into the OCGC report, and there's some pretty good stuff in there. We can all learn something to change the way we practice, to change the way we communicate, to make sure that we aren't just a statistic. So let's look about the uh, nature of the violations and what it is that most commonly was seen last year, or excuse me, in 2012. Uh, communication. 386 of the complaints dealt with communication. We're talking about uh, return phone calls, status updates in writing, uh, status updates when there's really nothing to update. I think there's some precautionary measures we can all take to ensure that clients feel that they're being communicated with and especially in the area of family law, when emotions run high. Diligence, we'll talk a little bit about what that means, pursuing the case, timely filing. If you dig down into diligence, a lot of those numbers come from personal injury cases, where an attorney's evaluating the case, hasn't filed the action, doesn't file the action, those types of matters. But there are some family law issues within diligence that talk about the pursuit of the case. We're going to talk about uh, requesting quick trial dates, pushing the matter, not delaying it. There's a whole host of complications when it relates to diligence. Uh, if you do a flat fee, uh, are you dragging it out for the purposes of collecting more money? If you do a, a ladder flat fee, those types of things. Uh, so 334 came from diligence. Safekeeping property, 217. Excessive fees, 115. Remember, I talked about fee disputes. Well, there we are. Uh, excessive fees. It is a violation. Rule 4 1.5. So, the standard that we have always taken and should be everyone's standard is your billing should be the lesser of what's actual or what's reasonable. So, in either way, lesser of actual or reasonable. So, reasonable is less, it's reasonable. If reasonable is more, you bill actual. It's the safest standard you can have when it comes to Rule 4 1.5. Dishonesty, fraud, deceit, misrepresentation. Obviously, those are really easy ones to identify. I would guess of the 856 formal investigations, some of those, you know, the 83 is a big number. But if you look at the big three, I call, uh, if you want to focus on and your takeaway from today is the big three, which would be communications, diligence, and fees. Those represent 41% of all the complaints. Not to say that you should disregard the remainder, but if your practice is built upon those three pillars, that you ensure your chances of that audit probably get cut by 80%. And you can rest a little bit easier as you practice. Rule 4.1.16. Improper withdrawal, and that happens more frequently than you can imagine. Uh, I used to read up, uh, and many of you may, may do this every you know, Tuesday, you get the slip opinions. There were a whole host of appellate decisions on withdrawal, the appropriateness of withdrawal, the timing of withdrawal, the notification on withdrawal, reasons. Those are all key. But if you don't follow and you don't do something timely, you know, in advance of trial, you have to look at when's the trial, what's the, what is the damage that's going to happen to the client regardless of the reason for withdrawal. Uh, I would tell you to go ahead and pull some of those appellate decisions. They're very informative. Uh, they will guide you as to what you need to do in the event that you have to withdraw from that case. And I'm not talking about something where there's a conflict that's arisen where it's mandatory that you withdraw or uh, some sort of behavior, fraudulent or criminal behavior by your client that forces you to withdraw. We're talking about Failure to pay, failure to communicate, uh, something in those regards. But I think it's key. That is a huge one because 73 complaints on withdrawal. Something as simple as getting out of the case is a big one. Conflict 67, take away. Make sure you look at your conflict check resolution program. What is it, what's in place if you have one? You have to have a conflict resolution program to do that. I think one of the more, I talked about this a couple years ago, I think one of the more complicated scenarios for conflict checking is when you hire an attorney from another firm and trying to get 
all of the cases and clients that they represent. When a client comes in the door, how it's a pretty big problem when they can't bring that information with them. The law firm may or may not disclose the number of clients they've had. So it's as simple as perhaps if you have a multi-attorney office is sending out an email of the retentions weekly, bi-weekly, that indicates who has retained and making sure that everyone reviews it. And if they recognize the conflict, you've done some diligence to do it. 35 on unauthorized practice of law. 33 on advertising, especially uh, with a constant change of rules and our social networking, our internet, the rules related to what you have to do. I can tell you uh, that I, you know, when I'm listening to the radio, I constantly hear ads that don't comply with the rules, I think. My opinion. Not so clear, but I think it makes me worry. I think, you know, if it was very clear, it would be a problem. Obviously, you have an obligation to report it. But it just kind of makes you wonder. You have to read. If you're going to do the advertising, read the rules. Follow it. It's are simple. There's some disclosures you have to put on there. And it's it's not terrible. I mean, there's some states that we practice in, Kentucky and Florida. Kentucky, you have to say this is an advertisement on every page on the Internet, on every ad. Uh, Iowa, when you do an advertisement, you cannot advertise in a... Uh, Voice. A dramatic voice. It cannot be dramatic. <laughs> it must be monotone. This is no way. So it's crazy. I mean, you think about it, and you could easily gloss over some of those things. But again, the goal in life for me and, and our firm is play by the rules. Simple. Don't make yourself a target. And uh, life is much simpler that way. Competence. 23. We we'll talk a little bit about competence, and I know that that's an argument we were having about uh, the ability to take case outside of your comfort zone. Truth to tribunal, 21. That's what I was talking about is candor, honesty, uh, how you deal with the, the bench. Uh, huge and uh, important because I always told uh, some of the new attorneys that one thing you have, it necessarily won't be how you, your understanding of the law, how you try cases, is it's honesty. It's what it is to me. It's how you deal with the bench and the bar. Uh, and if you can make that the focus of your practice for the rest of your career, it's a good one, no matter what. Uh, so 21 on truth to tribunal, which is a big number, surprisingly. Truth to third parties, 21, not necessarily something that I think in family law we see quite often, but it, it is what it is. Confidentiality, we were talking about this outside, 18. Uh, there's a whole host of com our issues within confidentiality that we can talk about. I know Barb's going to address that. Supervisory responsibility, 7. And that one's a disturbing one for me because uh, there are some issues, I think, that you can be a part of that you've done nothing. For example, nothing to violate the rule directly. Uh, so you can get called into the regional committee because a lawyer underneath you didn't do something that you may have told them to do. For example, uh, judgment comes in, that lawyer tried the case that works for you. Uh, you sit down and you just talk about appeal. What are, you know, what are your thoughts on this judgment? Is there anything to appeal? Let's look at uh, the rulings, let's think about it. And you say, yeah, I think there is. Why don't you go ahead and notify the client, give them the deadline, tell them what they need to do, how much it'll cost, uh, how many days they have to notify us, what the timelines are to file the appeal. Lawyer doesn't respond. Lawyer doesn't tell the client, right? So client decides to just call the office and says, what's I haven't heard? Is the judgment in? You find out and you panic, go to lawyer, and the lawyer says, oh, I forgot. Client files a bar complaint. You're on the hook because you're the supervisory responsible attorney. You told someone to do, and as professionals, we all think that professionals will do as they should and as they're instructed, you're still on the hook. That's a disturbing one because it's uh, it's one where you, you didn't intend it. You actually took the appropriate action. You, you reviewed it, a junior associate's work. You told them what to do. You're still on the hook. So, you know, it's the trust but verify rule. You tell someone to do something but verify they did it. Otherwise, you're on the hook. Criminal activity, seven, which is a good sign, only seven. Criminal activity. It's crazy. 
obstruction, false evidence, or another one. Uh, you know, you, you look at some of these, you think, I, someone said too many lawyers. Well, there you go. There are 11 too many lawyers in this state with the criminal activity and obstruction of false evidence. Ex parte contact, four. Uh, prosecutorial responsibility, obviously, doesn't apply to this, but two. So, as we think about uh, what we've just covered, what do you think are the, I know we'll all know this, the number one area of practice with the most complaints? Domestic. Number two? Criminal? Criminal. And number three? Torts. Which is, you know, interesting. So domestic had 173 complaints of those investigated, or 20% of the actually formally investigated complaints came from our area. Big number. So now, if you look at the total number of attorneys investigated compared to the total number in our area, we should be a little bit more nervous. Because we're not just dealing with logical uh, issues regarding ethics, we're dealing with emotion. We're dealing with clients that will file a complaint because they think you colluded with the judge, or back in chambers, you're selling them out. So there are a lot of things you just have to dot your eyes, cross your T's. It's a big one. <clears throat> so one of the things we want to do is look at some specific areas as it relates to some of the specific uh, issues and the rules so that we can give you a little bit of guidance. Uh, again, I guess it, it is a little bit blah and boring, but I think it's worthy and we'll, we'll kind of, again, toss it out. So, Question uh, under 4-1.1, which is the client lawyer relationship, we talked about competence, and that's a, that's a big one. So the question is, uh, I'm a family law lawyer. That's all I really do, that's all I do. I have done all kinds of other areas, but for the last 15 plus years, I think only devoted to family law. My boss wants me to take on a breach of contract claim, or a client comes in the door and wants me to take a breach of contract claim. Can I? So the question is, and I thought about this a couple hours ago, I was just going through it, and I think the key words are, can I or should I? There are two very different standards. So the answer really is, yes, you can. And that's under Rule 4-1.1 in the comments. Now, keep in mind, all the comments, I think, are under your thumb drive. All of the rules, the applicable rules, are in your thumb drive, so you'll have them. Uh, you can refer to them, and I'm going to read a few of it just so that you understand kind of why. Uh, we argued about this and whether I should take it. It's really clear if a client comes to me and says, I have a patent case, will you take it or can you take it? The answer is clearly no. It's such a subspecialty. But the comments on the rules say, in determining whether a lawyer employs the requisite knowledge and skill in a particular matter, relevant factors in your decision include the complexity and specialized nature of the matter, your general experience, training experience in the field in question, the preparation and study the lawyer is able to give the matter, and whether it is feasible to refer the matter to an associate or consult with a lawyer or who is established and competent in that field of question. So it goes on to state that the fundamental legal skills consist of determining what problems are in the situation, a skill that's necessary transcends any particularized specialized knowledge, and a lawyer that can provide adequate representation in a wholly novel field through necessary study. The question becomes is, can you take it? Yes. Are you better off not? Yeah. Uh, I would certainly just farm it out, no matter how hungry you may be. Uh, but or, or co-counsel is someone who can do it, because that's what the comments refer to, getting someone who has the relevant knowledge. But to go further with that question, so can I charge my client for familiarizing myself with the relevant case or relevant law related to his claims? So what we were arguing out there is extreme to extreme. I know nothing about contract law. Let's just say I know zero. I've never handled one. I've never done a civil matter like that. Can I just charge my client because he wants me to represent him? Again, these are, these are some words at play. I mean, who says, you know, can you charge your client to familiarize yourself with the law related to his claims. It's a show of hands. Who can say, yes, you can? And no. I'm a, and the other rest of you have no idea who works <laughs> Well, the answer, surprisingly, 
And I, and, and I, I question this, and it's a big caution, is yes. Under comment two, it talks about you can do this and charge the client for it. Now, again, can I, should I? I don't think there's, there's a difference. We were talking about extreme to extreme. There are issues that come up in our, our cases every day, perhaps, where you have to do some research because you want to find some cases that support your novel argument. That's acceptable. That's one extreme. And I think that is clearly acceptable. There's no problem. We're not talking about the uh, reasonableness of the fee or the charge. But on the other extreme is you know nothing. Can you just learn? You know, contracts for dummies. And even though the comments suggest you can, I, I just think it's, it's, it's a gray area. I wouldn't do it. Uh, they suggest that you can do it. Again, I think if you're going to and your client is insistent, that they want you and only you, I think you have to have a very specific acknowledgement by them of what they're agreeing to charge, allow you to charge them. And be very clear the representation at the outset, what it is that you're gonna have to undertake and what it is they're agreeable to. And even then, I can tell you, I've seen opinions from the uh, Supreme Court where if the client isn't consulted with another lawyer, they don't know what they're getting into, it's still problematic. I just, I stay away from it. Uh, you know, unless you have dealt with those types of issues, I just think you, you don't. Yes? There are some courts that will assign criminal appeals to attorneys when they are admitted to that court. Do you have any comments on that? I know that, uh, it's like, well, I can tell you, here's a good example. When I was a uh, new lawyer, and uh, I thought it was the thing you were supposed to do, which was go ahead and, admit, and uh, enroll to be in the U.S. District Court, the Eastern District of Missouri, not knowing that I would get a civil rights case. <laughs> uh, I had no idea what I was doing, right? I got my civil rights case within a couple months, and it actually went to trial. Now, it turned out to be a really good case, but I think there are, and I don't know specifically, but I'm certain there are probably some immunity issues that you get when you're appointed by the court as it relates to uh, malpractice, but and from an ethics standpoint, I think you're clear, you're not charging your client. Uh, in the state, you get your expenses paid, and I know you, you can negotiate a separate fee agreement, which that was what I did with this uh, prisoner was, in the event of a, of a judgment, you can negotiate some sort of contingency. But my understanding is you, that you can take it because you're appointed by the court. You're ordered to take it as a member of the bar. And I know some courts are requiring uh, based on a number of practice if you take certain matters. Uh, and if you feel really uncomfortable, I think you have to address that with the court. And say, look, I, I don't know what I was doing. I was just talking about, I used to prosecute, but I, could, I wouldn't be comfortable taking murder cases. No way. Uh, I mean, I'd have to study, but again, you're not charging a client. But that is your obligation, your service to the bar. If the court feels that you're uh, capable, you do it. I think it's okay, though. Anyone else have a comment to that? All right. My client called me from jail. He has a bond hearing tomorrow and wants me to help. I've never done a criminal case, can I? Uh, so keep in mind the specific facts of this. He's not asking you to defend him on the charge. He's saying, I have a bond hearing. Can you help me? So the answer is cautiously yes. So in comment three, it says, in an emergency, and that's key, a lawyer may give advice or assistance in a matter in which the lawyer does not have the skill, ordinarily required where referral to or consultation or associated with another lawyer would be impractical. Even in an emergency, however, assistance should be limited to that reasonably necessary in the circumstances for ill-considered action under emergency conditions that can jeopardize the client's interest. So again, you have to be cautious. He calls you, it's after hours, you can't get some of the bond hearings at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. It is just a bond hearing. If you want to go, you can, so long as you make sure you engage in a limited representation. We'll talk about that here shortly. Yes? Once you're in, you're in. Yeah, right. Once you're in, you're in. That's the caution. That's why I said if you can get, now there are some of the rules allowed now for a limited representation, but that is the caution again. Once you're in, you're in. So that's why I said you can cautiously, yes. Uh, and I know in some of our other jurisdictions we practice, New York, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in, never out, never out. Yes.
At the, at the end of the case, what we had done years ago, or what I did, um, I can tell you what I did with my appointing case in the federal court. It went to trial. Uh, we went to judgment. And I knew there was going to be some appeal afterwards. I asked the court to withdraw at that point because my appointment was officially over. They let me out. And I think that's the safest way to do it is to not just conclude the case. I mean, Georgia. It's a very interesting area. When I practice in Georgia, it is routine, no matter what, to always withdraw at the conclusion of the case. Because you don't want to be hooked on the hook. Because what happens in Georgia, and I respect her, you get, you get a phone call on a domestic violence, and you have about two hours to come in. They may just call you and say, well, you're on the case, you're coming in in two hours. And you haven't been retained, you haven't been paid, uh, you have to go in. So, I, and I can tell you, we used to, I used to withdraw just as a matter of cause. I think that's probably the appropriate thing. Do I have to uh, do the entire case? Again, talking about scope of representation, which is interesting because of the new some rules with regards to that. I thought this was uh, something worthy of review. 4-1.2, uh, under client-lawyer relationship. My client only wants help with settlement negotiations. Can I step in? Now, I, can, I know that many of us have had this happen where clients come in the door, they say, oh, it's settled. Let me show you where it is. Oh, it's settled on this legal path, by the way. And she's agreed to it all. Right. And do you want to get it? Now, I don't want to hire you to, to file the case other than unless it's settled. Or they give you the actually tight written settlement agreement that perhaps another lawyer has done for them and they want you to review it and advise them. Uh, yeah. Practically, or whether you want to do that again, should I, can I, totally different, I wouldn't. But the rules say, yes, you can do it. You can enter with a client and help them with settlement negotiations. Uh, under Rule 4-1.2, subsection C, which says, a lawyer may limit the scope of representation if the client gives informed consent in writing, signed by the client, to the essential terms of the representation and the lawyer's limited role. Now, the thing that I think you have to be cautious with is you can't just explain it. You have to get a subsequent agreement. The fee, there's, uh, if you look at the comments, to that rule, there is actually a sample of what you should be putting into that agreement if you want to do something like that. And I would follow it to the letter. Uh, that way you can say, look, I follow what the rules say, I follow what the comments suggested, I'm good. But I think that uh, it is a problem, and I think it's perhaps more geared to uh, defense attorneys who are doing insurance defense, those types of things with plaintiffs, cases where you can just negotiate uh, and step in and do that. Do you need a special fee agreement? Of course, that's what we just said, 4.1, or 4-1.2, subsection C. You absolutely need that special agreement uh, where it's very extensive. It talks about, very explicitly, the representation is limited. You describe what exactly you're doing, and I mean describe it. Uh, the, the lawyer does not represent the client generally or in any matters other than those identified in the form. As soon as you deviate from that, you go into that terrible work trouble territory, where if you deviate from this review or just settlement negotiations, it's problematic. Uh, now, it does not apply to an initial consultation with a lawyer or pro bono services, which is interesting. So, uh, and services provided by nonprofits. My client wants me to help him engage in insurance fraud. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> I guess it depends on what's in it for me. And then again, I'd be into those number 47 attorneys that are too many in the state of Missouri. I think we all know the answer to that. Absolutely not. 4.12-F, I know that's crazy, but I can tell you, uh, we talk about clients who come in and say, hey, how do I hide my assets? And they whisper, how do I hide As if somebody else is listening. And I'm going to whisper back, I don't know. <laughs> So, a lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct that the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent. No news to us, but, but, a lawyer may discuss the legal consequences of the proposed course of conduct with a client and may counsel or assist to make a good faith effort to determine validity, scope, meaning, or application of a law. So, you know, we talk about clients come in and uh, the one I always talk about asked me this question. He had uh, inherited some 
rental property from his mother, and he wanted to hide all of the red thing. And I said, look, there's no need to hide it. Let's talk about the law. Let's talk about the separate property. Let's talk about how we can get this revenue and keep the property. I think it just went in one ear and out the other, and he didn't listen. And Well, he went out the door, and, uh, and I just forgot, and he came back and retained probably six months later, and I didn't connect the dots. I hadn't written some notes about it, which a lesson. They're going to say something about it, write some notes in the file so you can connect the dots. Anyway, we wound up doing some things, and he was hiding assets and funneling money. and. Uh, so it's not as if I gave him any advice, but the point is, the lesson learned in that is to take some notes in your initial consults. So when they do come back, if they come back, it's a red flag. And you can counsel the client as to what you do. And I always tell clients, look, if, if your strategy and what you want, I can do a lot with what you want. There's not much I can't come up with a nice argument, a nice plan, unless it deals with child abuse or spousal abuse. Look, that's just stuff that's it's a, it's a non-starter. So anyway, it's clear. Of course, we can't talk about this. Uh, in the same manner, my client wants to keep all the financial accounts. He wants to transfer them to a hidden overseas bank account. What should I do? I know that sounds crazy, but I have had clients not only ask me, but tell me that they've done that, right? So what do you do in that moment? I will counsel them, and I will respectfully refer them to an attorney I don't like. <laughs> So it says, uh, we talk about separating objectives from means. What is, and that's referred to in this, and you think, what in the world does that mean? Well, how will we be, how will we obtain a desired result? The objective and the means. So you can counsel, the comments say, the client has ultimate authority to determine the purposes to be served within the limits imposed by law and the lawyer's professional obligations. Within those limits, a client also has a right to consult with a lawyer about the means to be used and in pursuing those objectives. At the same time, a lawyer is not required to pursue objectives or employ means simply because a client may wish the lawyer to do so. So that's why it talks about separating objectives and means. Look, and that, the example I just gave you, let's separate the objective and mean. He said, I want to keep my property in the revenue. His means were, I want to funnel it and defraud the court. My means are, well, I can argue separate property separate those two, because they mix those with things that really shouldn't be done. I am too busy, and everyone is busy, we know that. And I, I can tell you early on in my career, I remember having 100 family law files. It was crazy. And uh, you know, I was a young lawyer, and lessons learned, and it's one of those things which gets you in trouble. You may forget a court date. Uh, you may not notify a client. So this is a big one for me. This is number two on the list of complaints with the most ethics issues. Number two, the client-lawyer relationship 4-1.3 and diligence. I need to slow this case down because I'm so busy. I, you know, I, can't, I can't go to court. I've got three trials next week. I've got two PDLs the next week, settlement conference. I have too much on my plate. Can I? No. The answer is no, you cannot. Because we've all been there. Family law, in particular, you can get a lot of cases in the door at one point. Or you're solo or small firm and you have to. In order to pay the bills, you've got to take as many as you can take. Uh, and it is a little bit crazy. But uh, the comments talk about what you can and can't do. 4-1.3 says, comment one, a lawyer should pursue a matter on behalf of the client despite opposition, obstruction, and here's the key, or personal inconvenience to the lawyer. That one bothers me a little bit because there are a lot of things that can be personally inconvenient. I've got a vacation set. I can tell you in Georgia, you get you don't get a choice. You don't go into chambers and the judge says, well, all right, let's set this for trial. Here's what I have. You just get a date. Whether it's inconvenient to you or not, if you are showing up, then you can file, um, what's it called? It's uh, exclusive dates. Yeah, a leave of absence, they call it in Georgia. But the point is, is I think that's pretty important. Uh, to your personal inconvenience. So that means you have too much going on, you have another case going on, you have to juggle it. Then it goes on to say, and take whatever lawful and ethical measures are required to vindicate a client's cause or endeavor. Note two says a lawyer's workload must be controlled so that each matter can be handled competently. For 
For example, a lawyer may have authority to exercise discretion in determining the means, but he must have the ability. So, that means hire somebody, cook counsel, or decline the case. The thing that I learned early on was don't take every case. You don't need it. It's too risky. Uh, I know that it, it's uh, money in the door and you're pushing it out, but it's not worth your license. This is what you work hard for. You need to just turn it down. Or you need to hire an associate or a law clerk. Uh, that's the safest thing to do. Note three goes on to say, even when the client's interests are not affected in substance, unreasonable delay can cause a client needless anxiety, sound familiar? And undermine confidence in the lawyer's trustworthiness. Family law, they should just write family law comment right there. <laughs> that is true, what we have is, why am I not a trial? Why am I not in court? Why can't I get a judgment? Why am I not doing this? Why, why, why? It's like your children, why? That's where you are. So diligence, that's why it's number two on the list. I would bet if we dug down into those 100 or 273 family law complaints, diligence perhaps would be number one within family law. <clears throat> Do I have to take the first trial they offered? No. You do not have to take the first trial date, but I think you have to have that caution, remember, with the word personal inconvenience. Because a lawyer should pursue a matter despite opposition, it goes on to state, the duty to act with reasonable diligence does not require the use of tactics that are aggressive, offensive, or to anyone. The point is, is you have to use your discretion. Uh, you can indicate that you cannot reasonably and competently go to trial on a date that you just can't do it. There are some exclusions to that, but it all comes down to, look, don't take more than you can handle. You won't have the problem about trial dates conflicting if you don't take on too much. What does my client need to know? So that is the number one complaint, and, and for my portion, that's where I'm going to end because I wanted to go through the number one and number two. The 4-1.4. The client lawyer relationship, communication, communication, communication. It leads all complaints. My client just wants this to go away. So he gave me permission to settle this case. Can I really leave him out of it? Well, he gave you permission. Uh, he told you what you should do. I'll settle for $100 in child support, $100 in maintenance, 50% of the property, right? Let's say he's living in a dream world. You say, okay, I'll go try and settle it. You get exactly what he said. Every word, you get it. Can you settle it? Can you just without calling it? Yes or no? Not entirely. The rules are a little bit ambiguous. Again, the distinction between can I or should I, it's like when you took the uh, ethics test when you became a lawyer, I always thought about you know the can I or should I. Avoid the should I's because it's like, oh, there's some gray, it's, it's can I. It's, it's, you shouldn't do it. I can tell you as a medical practice what I do, if I'm engaging in any settlement negotiation and I have full authority to settle something and I've counseled the client and I go to the lawyer and we agree to the terms that my client gave me, I will tell the lawyer, look, I'm confident we got this settled, but I'm going to go double check with my client exactly and go through it again and say, I want to go through this again. I want to make sure you understand what you're agreeing to before I agree to it. So it is not entirely because rule comment two, rule 4-1.4, says the client should have sufficient information to participate in intelligently in decisions concerning the objectives of the representation. For example, a lawyer who receives from opposing counsel an offer of settlement in a civil controversy or a proffered plea bargain must promptly inform the client of its substance unless the client has previously indicated that the proposal will be acceptable or unacceptable or has authorized the lawyer to accept, to, or reject the offer. Even when a client delegates authority to a lawyer, the client should be advised of the status of the matter. So, that last sentence, first we were like, oh, okay, I can do it, and then the last sentence goes, hmm, I don't think I can. So that's why it is clearly not entirely, because the comment suggests, if the client's giving you authority to do it, you do it, you can settle it. The nice thing in family law is, you have to have it in writing, you have to have it approved by the judge, they can back out because it got settled tonight. That's a nice thing. But in reality, you're going to get an ethics complaint if you try to settle a case and you say, well, you gave me the authority, orally, mistake number one. Anything the client
client's going to do, I'm going to put in writing, saying, okay, this is the authority you gave me, X, Y, and Z. Here's what I think is good. This is what's bad. Uh, and make sure that everything's in writing. What is enough communication? What is? Depends, right? So if you look at comments one and three, under rule 4-1.4, there are some shalls in there. Not should, not may. A lawyer shall keep the client reasonably informed about the status of the matter, promptly comply with reasonable requests for information, and consult with the client about any relevant limitation on the lawyer's conduct when the lawyer knows the client expects assistance not permitted by the rules of professional conduct. And a lawyer shall explain the matter to the extent necessary to permit the client to make an informed decision. So, what I think the lesson, uh, you know, everything that happens in the course of your career, you should be taking a note and change the way you practice to accommodate the rules, like by weekly updates, something in writing, updating the client constantly, phone calls. Nothing angers clients more than waiting for you to return their call. Have your assistant call them, update them. Even when there's nothing to update, just say, hey, I just want to call you and let you know I'm still waiting to hear from opposing counsel. I follow up you know, with them, and uh, I will update you tomorrow. Send an email. Hey, just confirming. I just want to let you know what's going on. And then don't come for both, obviously, but you're doing one to cover yourself. That is the lesson learned on communication. More is better. Definitely better. My client is going to hate the expert report, and I might do something stupid. Do I have to send it to him? So the question is, is and again, uh, is obviously up for discussion, but not immediately pursuant to the rules, which is interesting. In some circumstances, rule six, or comment six in rule four dash one and four, a lawyer may be justified in delaying transmission of information, and here's when. And the client would be likely to react imprudently to an immediate communication. So that describes every single family law client I've ever had. <laughs> so uh, there is no exclusion for me. I just send it to them. I mean, I, I do. And I know it's terrible. And I know that's, for example, uh, and I think it's a good one why some judges don't rule from the bench on certain matters, because they would act imprudently. And it's better to receive in writing later when they can calm down. But I think it is important that time is of the essence. And there's a whole section that rules of uh, the Supreme Court rules about time. And it's one of the first ones. And so I think even though it says we can, again, can I or should I, I would not delay unless he says, look, if I get this expert report and he says I am bipolar, I'm going to go kill him. Now, maybe you want to hold off a little bit. So there are some reasons to do it, but I don't think if, that it is even though it says we can, again, should we? Those are the two questions you always ask, can I or should I? And I keep repeating that, so. My client is going to hate this letter, and I just don't want to deal with it. Can I toss it? Can I just throw it away and never say it? We're just going to act like this never happened. No, you cannot. It's, so the point is, again, what we talked about, you can delay transmission by the rules. You can wait till the appropriate time but I don't see a manner in which you can ever not send something. And I think the best way, one of the things, changes we made was everything in, everything goes out, no matter what it says. Uh, you, you may not like it personally because it may say something about you or your delay. It may implicate you in your failure to communicate. You gotta send it. Because that's the one thing that you're gonna get hammered on by the, uh, the OCDC is not sending all communication. $15 an hour in order to accommodate this high maintenance situation that you've um, agreed to take on. So going back to that question I suggested we talk about, if a client comes in and he's four weeks out of his trial, who thinks you can take that case at all? Nobody. Nobody? I don't either. I don't touch these cases. But a lot of lawyers do, and they do it very well. And if you ask them, they would say, of course I can. Because all I need to do is make sure that I'm 
as fully prepared as I can become in four weeks. But I think that's wrong. I think that when you take a case, you are charged with having worked that case from the very beginning. Those are your responsibilities. It's not a part of these slides, but it came up in terms of my own thought process of uh, what we would talk about today. And I find that that question fascinates me, that, that there are so many people who uh, have very different opinions about whether they would take that case or not. It's interesting to me that nobody here would. Yes? I don't think that becomes your problem. And in fact, one of the slides says, do I have to take every case that walks in the door? I don't think you do. I don't think you have any obligation to take a client who needs help, um, but uh, has precluded himself from really getting the full benefit of the lawyer from the beginning. So I would say absolutely not. You don't have to take that case. Yeah. Does anybody disagree on that ground, that he can't find anybody else to help him? In terms of whether you can prepare for those, uh, I I would agree. So what? So give me a scenario where you would be willing to take a case where you had four weeks, a typical family case. No kids, no real property, and Okay. So you're four weeks out. I don't know the witness disclosure rules in Missouri. I practiced in Denver. I think Scott said that. Um, so in terms of getting on a case where the witnesses have or have not already been disclosed. How, how would that impact your decision? I'm curious, I think that your uh, position makes sense in terms of the limited issues. But what if you can't, what if you can't disclose witnesses at that point and you think there's a, a boss that needs to come in and talk about, oh, did you say no kids? Okay, so we're just talking. Okay. change my uh, my decision a little bit but that's not typically what walks in my door so yeah yeah <laughs> um, it's typically much more complicated but I, I think I would revise that answer a little bit that yes under some circumstances I can envision a scenario where I would comfortably but um, those I, I'm those don't come in very often yes
can I take that case, that post-judgment case, on a contingency fee? Who thinks we can? Well, you can. Uh, it's very clear. Post-judgment issues, recovery of maintenance, recovery of child support, we can take on a contingency fee. I've never seen anybody do it in Colorado. I don't know if you see it very regularly here. And I think that's because generally as lawyers, family law lawyers who are very well schooled in not taking things on a contingency basis, really don't like this, really don't like that part of it. Um, I don't see it very often, but you certainly can. So there's a distinction between pre-judgment and post-judgment as well as the issues that you're facing. So now the next question is really, rep who, who can I represent? Who, where, what am I able to do in terms of clients that may have some relationship to a former client? My friends want me to help them form a joint venture. They've all come to me, they've decided what they want. They want to invest in an airfield residence. So they bought the airstrip, they bought the properties around it. They want to start selling it. They haven't drafted any agreement to this date. There's three of them. They want me to help them. One of them is a pilot. Present that under that scenario. Okay, I agree with you. I don't think you can, even if they're interested. To the table. Okay. If they bring more value, then you may want them to secure more out of that agreement. I assure you, no, no, we're all good here. I believe you've still got to anticipate that there's going to be a time when you're going to have to counsel them differently and you're going to want to counsel them separately. But you can't do that because you've got to be fully open with all of your clients. So if we've got one um, who's a pilot and has more to bring, then I think the answer is no. I think the answer is still no, even if there's, they're all exactly the same. They're all stockbrokers. They know nothing about airfield properties, but they all want to invest. They've been best friends since high school, and they just want you to do this for them because they're not in litigation. Just help them. Come on. Play golf together. I don't think you can do it. So what if I just get them all to sign a waiver and protect me from that conflict? How can I do that? Who thinks that with a waiver, from all three of those people, pilot or non-pilot included, that you can represent them with a waiver. You're right. You can't. Yes? that we have to tell our clients 
that the agreement they want to enter into is too bad. Uh, it precludes us from representing um, all of our friends. Even when they're not aligned uh, or they're not in litigation at this point. So what about, this happens frequently in my experience. So Missouri allows a grandparent to enter a case uh, per, to pursue grandparents' rights or they can pursue custody. So you've got a situation where maybe you have two young parents and mom of your client wants to intervene because she wants to make absolutely sure that that woman never spends time alone with her grandchild. And the son, who maybe lives with mom, says absolutely. I don't care how we get it. We don't want that time to go to her. But they both have custody um, interests. Who thinks that you can represent son and mom? I, I agree, you can't. Um, their interests may be aligned. They may articulate to you that their interests are aligned. But you've got an obligation to consult grandma and say, if, if she was your client, you've got to say, grandma, you know, you're actually best suited maybe to take this child and have full custody and have sole decision making. Um, your, your position is stronger than your son's. Or son, what you've got to understand is that if grandma wants time, even though you love her and you're pretty much going to let her see this child whenever she wants, she's going to get those rights and they're going to interfere with yours. So even if everybody's on the same page again at this point, you can't represent both. Not at all. I've seen it happen a lot. I have a lot of lawyers suggest to me that of course they can because their interests are aligned. And I don't think it matters if their interests are currently aligned. It's the potential that they may not be aligned and the obligation to tell them that they may have an advantage over the other party and that they may want to seek to secure that advantage. Does anybody think that's different if they're just seeking grandparents' rights? All they want is three, three week vacation a year. That's all they want. It's not different, I agree. Same thing, basically same thing. That time's gonna come from somewhere. They cannot, what if they say, okay, I'm not, I don't wanna take it from my sons. I wanna take it from her, can I just do that? Same thing, you can't, you just, you've gotta leave it alone. And I uh, suggest that she find uh, another lawyer and that she find a, a good and competent lawyer. If you look at the comments, particularly comment eight, it again requires you really consider all possible positions your client would want to assert. So not just the articulated positions, but the possible positions. And that's again where we run into the idea that the articulated positions may be fine and perfectly aligned, but all possible positions may not be.
when you're looking to determine if there's a conflict, what you first got to do, there's a few, if you look at the rules in the comments, it, it kind of helps you sort of figure out what you've got to do, the, the thought process you have to go to make this determination. Because remember, some, some conflicts are waivable, and uh, sometimes they're not the conflict that we think they are. So first you have to identi uh, identify your clients. Who's my potential client? Um, and at that point, you've identified them, and then you determine, is there a conflict here? So you look at it, say yes, there's a potential conflict. Then you ask yourself, can I still proceed? Is this a consensible conflict? Can they consent to my representation? If the answer is no, then you stop there. If the answer is yes, then you um, typically can go forward and get consent. And that consent has to be informed and in writing. And that's actually, if you read the rules, a part that a lot of practitioners stop at. They fail to get that last piece, that informed consent in writing. And that's pretty important. It has to be, um, it doesn't have to be lengthy, but it has to clearly lay out um, the, um, what the conflict is and where uh, the issue is in terms of your ethical obligation and what you owe the client who's waiving the conflict so that they can knowingly waive that conflict. So now we've got um, another type of conflict. So now I've got a client and I represented him in his divorce and during the course of the representation, we talked a lot about a restaurant that I'm opening up. Now he wants to invest in my restaurant. Um, I've done a lot of work in restaurant agreements. I know a lot about it. He knows very little other than that he thinks it's a great idea and he's going to make some money. Can I let him invest with me? Who thinks I can? Right. I can, but what do I have to do before uh, I let him sign on the dotted line. Sorry? Right, that's one piece of it. First of all, you have to make sure that the terms you're drafting up, and you can draft the terms, that's fine. Um, they have to be fair, um, reasonable, and all of the terms have to be fully disclosed in that agreement that you're drafting. It has to be in writing that you are advising them to seek counsel to consider this more fully and objectively. That has to be in writing. And they have to have time to have sought out that counsel. So it's a bad idea to say, I've drafted up the terms. Come on in. Here's what they say, kind of. Come on in and we'll sign it. And then while they're signing it, you say, well, you know, you, you can take this to another counsel. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. Even though theoretically at that point he could say, okay, I'm going to, and I'll see you in a week. I think we've created a situation where we're suggesting there's an expectation that he signed that agreement now. That's a bad idea. Give it to them. I'll let them take it out the door and figure it out on their own. I think that piece is actually very similar to the idea of when we're getting an unrepresented party to sign a separation agreement that we've drafted. Clients always want us to have that agreement drafted, and then everybody comes in, sit down, and talk about it, which we can do. We can talk about an agreement with somebody who's not represented. We just can't advise them on that agreement. But maybe our client wants them to get it signed because he knows she's in a hurry, she's leaving on vacation, she just wants this done. Who think that's a good idea to get that signed that day? Even though your client really, really wants it done, and he's afraid that after her vacation, she's going to come back and she's going to change her mind on maintenance. So you better take advantage now of that opportunity to secure a good result for your client and get her to sign it. Can you, can you have her sign it there? Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's a bad idea. Um, I think you can put all the language in there that she had the opportunity to consult uh, with, a, with a lawyer of her own choosing. But if you, if you set up the situation such that she might feel pressured or really unable to move forward with that um, and walk out the door with it, then I think you've subjected your client to having that agreement set aside. So it's very similar if you're going to enter a business venture with a client. And it's the same if you want to engage in his business venture. Maybe he's going to open up the restaurant after his divorce and he wants your support. You can do it. You just got to be cautious about it.
So I put this in here, this next question. The lawyer, I, 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 I golf, I play golf with this lawyer on occasion. I'm getting a divorce, now he's gonna represent my wife. Can he do that? Well, yeah, he can do it. Of course he can. But I put that in there because how many of you hear from your clients that he can't be her lawyer because there's a conflict. Um, he's our neighbor. I hear that all the time. And it's because it doesn't feel right. It feels too close. Um, it feels like that neighbor might have been their friend and now they're being betrayed in that regard because that neighbor is now representing their wife. So I hear those kinds of things a lot. Feels uncomfortable, I don't like it. I have a current situation um, where the other lawyer on the other side has represented my client's parents a long time ago. He didn't like it, made him very uncomfortable. He told me over and over again, there's a conflict. She can't do that, can she? But she can. Absolutely she can, because she's never represented you. What if in the course of that representation, she learned something about my client that's relevant to his divorce now? Can she at that point still represent? She didn't learn that in the course of representing my client. She learned, learned it in the course of representing my client's parents. But she knows it. I don't think she's prohibited from representing the spouse. I think I probably wouldn't if I were her. But I don't think she's at fault for doing it, even though my client doesn't like it. Feels wrong, very uncomfortable for him. And clients often get confused about what's really a conflict and what's not. And it's our job to help them understand that. Because sometimes they want you to move to get this other person removed, and there's just no basis for it. The decision there is whether that lawyer or you has represented that client in a same or substantially related matter. And if she hasn't, then she's okay. So now we've got to do these again for former clients. So I represented a client in a divorce. Now his ex-wife, who was the opposite party in that divorce, wants me to represent her in her new divorce. Can I? Not would I, but can I? No, you can't. Yeah, no, excuse me. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. And here's why. Her new divorce is neither a same nor a substantially related matter. It involves new kids. Um, it involves her income, but I already knew about that. It involves her new spouse. We don't even care necessarily that she has an ex-spouse. So I can do it. I think I'm clear. This is not a same or substantially related. Does anybody disagree with that? Would you? Yes. Uh, a modification of the original divorce. Um, then I don't think you can represent either one of them at that point. I think you can do the second one, but I don't think you can go back and help your client in a modification. And that's because you've got duties of loyalty and confidentiality to both of them now. So I think you can do the first, but not the second. So maybe, um, because we liked our last client and we want him to be able to come back, even though we're not prohibited, maybe we don't anyway. <laughs> because we want that client to come back. And it feels wrong for us to represent somebody on the other side, um, even in a new matter. Has anybody ever done that? Yes, did you have a? I have a question. Sure. Regarding what you said before about the parents, you know, the client's parents, being represented by this other attorney, what's something regarding the client or the field to this attorney in discussing this matter with this Um, so you're talking about the situation where uh, he thought it was a client, she represented his parents and something separately. Um, I'm not sure it would be a breach of, com I think it would be a breach of confidentiality, yes. So so what, we, what I said earlier is I think she can't use any of that. 
but I think she's okay to move forward with representation. Um, but yes, she does have those duties of confidentiality and those duties of privilege. I think confidentiality, um, some people would equate it. I think that you've got a hierarchy of, of responsibilities to your client. So no, that would, um, there, yeah, you've got a, there'd be a conflict there for sure. So in that same situation that we just talked about, where you've got, um, you represented a male client in his first divorce. Now his ex-wife wants you to help her in her new divorce. But you found out something just by virtue of your representation with the old client, that he was gonna do a favor to her at some point that would, that would benefit her in her new case. You just knew it because he said he was always going to do it. He said, I'm going to, you know, two years out, I'm going to pay off her car because I like her, we get along okay still, and she's struggling, and I'm going to do this for her. So now you're representing wife, and she's asserting a new maintenance claim. No maintenance paid by the last spouse. Now she's got a maintenance claim. She's asserting she's a car expense that needs to be covered. But you know that she's very likely, very soon, to no longer have that car expense. What can you do about that? I think that's a really hard issue because you've got information that your current client should know, but you learned it from a previous client. And you don't have the right um, to reveal information, as was just pointed out, that you picked up in the course of the representation by the client. So I think that's tricky. I think it's one of those situations where we have to consider it fully and look at the rules and make an independent decision as to what and how to deal with that information. I think probably conservatively, you'd go back to your old client and you'd say, maybe I want you to waive, waive the confidentiality privilege to the, or confidentiality to the extent that it might still exist or impact me working with this new client. And then it'll be up for you to decide if he says I'm not gonna do that. But remember they were friends, so he probably wouldn't. So imputed disqualification. I look at this rule all the time because it's tricky to me. I have to always go back to it. So the idea of imputed disqualification is just that. If one lawyer in the firm can't represent a client, no lawyer in the firm can represent a client. Unless it's for something that's not necessarily related to the, the matter. So, in other words, if one of your lawyers in the firm just could no longer help this client because he didn't like the way he parented or he had horrible political views that they disagreed over and prohibited his representation. So, for him, he probably should get out because it's impacting his ability to represent him. But that's not really the kind of imputed conflict that you're going to run into trouble with. That's okay. You can, the next lawyer in line can take that case. The kind of imputed disqualification that we're talking about here is really more what you see in 4-1.9, which is what we just talked about. All those rules and reasons that um, prohibit me from representing a client who's adverse, whose views are adverse, position is adverse. If I can't do it, nobody in the firm can do it. Now, there's interesting <coughs> distinctions in this rule, and you really have to pay attention to it. Because if I, at my old firm, didn't have anything to do with this case, I never, I never talked to husband, I never looked at husband's file, there were never any conferences over lunch that talked about this client, I don't share the same paralegal, the files aren't joint, I can't access that file. If I go to a new firm, and that firm represents wife, that's okay, because I didn't have actual knowledge of this client. So that's not gonna get us into trouble. Yes? Yeah, 
I think. Um, right. Yeah, and sometimes what comes up is the idea that well, you might not have known about this case, but you certainly know what strategy that firm employs, because you all talk about strategy in cases all of the time, and that's come up in my practice, and I agree with you. I'm ethically pretty conservative, and I think that if the new client says, uh, but remember, she's the one who wants us to stay on. So does she just want the lawyer to leave the firm? So I represented husband in my last, or <coughs> husband was represented by my firm in the last, in, in my last firm. Oh, yeah. <coughs> All right, I just new firms. My new firm represents the wife of my former client. So, yeah, so remember wife, so what are you suggesting? Wife wants us to stay on or doesn't want us to stay on? Right. <coughs> yeah. Well, I think that then wife, then, then that's a choice that wife needs to make. Um, because what would be the alternative? Well, they have their. You need to. You need to get the consent waived. So, or that you need to. Um, you need to have the privilege waived. So let's go back now. So, so if you look at the rules, um, you need to really fully consider and look at the comments. And if you go back to 1.9, remember some conflicts they can consent to. So, so I think when you um, are with the new firm, it's <coughs> the. Um, don't want to get confused here. So I've left a firm, or a lawyer that used to work for us has left the firm. I and and that and he used to represent husband. Now he's at wife's. I believe that it's actually um, a, a, well, the, hu the husband is likely to object, um, but the husband can consent as well and say that's okay. I consent. So it's wife um, who it's not it's not wife who's being impacted. Um, because you're coming um, to wife's firm. So I have information about husband when I'm over here, and now I'm coming over to wife's. So why wouldn't wife want to utilize those advantages? So, so it's husband that has to waive the conflict. Maybe I didn't understand your question. So, but I think if wife, uh, I'm not sure why wife would object, but I think if wife didn't like it, then wife's choice is to move on. Because wife does not have to waive the conflict. It's, it's husband that has to waive the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think the judge was right. I think I do not think. And actually, if you read the comments, they talk about drawing up a will. And the reason why I think the judge was right, and it surprises me that they didn't think this, is because when they were, when you're drawing up a will, um, you you have to talk to your clients about um, what what would happen in the in the case of a divorce. That that's something that they both have to know, even when their interests are aligned. I don't do estate practice, um, but in my I used to partner with a firm that did. And she never represented, she never drafted a will for both husband and wife. Um, but in this case, if it's appropriate, I think subsequent to that, they cannot represent just one party. So I think the judge was right. Um, do you agree that the judge was right? I was wondering what the motion Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, 
I agree. Yeah, and I don't think it changes even if the mandatory disclosures are uh, extensive like they are in Colorado. So I, I agree. So next we're going to talk about capacity. Capacity is one of my favorite things to really look at. I work with a lot of very new lawyers. And they get very excited or very anxious if they feel that their client can't follow their discussions. He can't remember anything. I have to say things several times. I am um, concerned that even when I have a discussion and I follow it in writing, that he can't really understand what I'm saying. He can't really follow it. So they almost immediately want to distance themselves from that client. And sometimes what they do is they say, I have to. Don't I have to, Barb? Um, I can't really help this guy. He can't follow me. He can't understand me. He can't make decisions. Your rules separate two scenarios. And I think it's really fascinating because the first part of the first section of that rule, which is, again, 14-4-1-14. Uh, 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 if you look at A and B, there's, there's some different language um, in B than there is in A. So in A, what it talks about is you have a concern that your client um, can't adequately consider decisions connected to representation or his ability to adequately consider decisions that are con connected to the representation is diminished. So he's a hard time. He can't really do it on his own. But the rule, section A, says your obligation there is to simply treat him like you treat every other client. You are to do everything you can to maintain a normal attorney-client relationship with him. It's fascinating to me. Because what Missouri has done is made a distinction between a client who maybe just can't adequately consider what he's meant to consider from what they say in B, which is, uses language that says, if the client cannot, or his capacity to adequately consider decisions connected to the representation is diminished, and, and he is at risk of suffering substantial harm unless we act. So in the first scenario, you're to treat him as normally as he can, as you can. You're to communicate with him regularly. And in light of our communication obligations, that might mean that we have to distill more in writing than we would. A summary isn't good for this client. We've got to detail it out and, and outline it very carefully. So we may have to step up the level of communication, but we do that all the time. We tailor our level of communication um, to the client that we're dealing with and how much we have to put in writing. So in scenario A, you're still to treat him or her um, like you do any other client and work to establish the most, most normalized attorney-client relationship, unless he's at risk of substantial harm. Um, and it's even physical. It's physical or financial. So if that's the scenario, then what the rules say is the lawyer may take protective action. It is not a shall. You are not mandated to act on that issue at that time. Again, new lawyers drives them crazy, makes them very anxious. They want to distance themselves. But remember, we've got obligations to not run away from this client. That's all over the rules. We've got to stick with this guy. We've got to make everything, um, do everything we can to make this manageable for him. So we don't have to act, but can we act? Of course we can, it says may. It's not a shall, but it's a may. That's no easy road either, because when you continue to re, um, look at your, your opportunities in that time, at that time, how can I help this guy? If I want to take protective measures for him, what are my options? Well, the comments lay out a lot of options that are very fairly friendly, fairly friendly. You can engage family members to help him in uh, the conversations you have with him. And interestingly enough, when you invite those family members in to help a client with diminished capacity, it is not a waiver of privilege. So you can have those conversations comfortably 
without thinking that I've waived the privilege or my client has waived the privilege. That's much different than the mom who wants to come in with her 20-year-old son because darn, that kid can't make a good decision to save his life, but he really can. So when mom sits in there under those scenarios, you, uh, the, 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 the privilege is already, it's probably been waived. But if you're dealing with a client with diminished capacity and mom wants to come in, or sister wants to come in, or grandma wants to come in to help, that's okay. And those, that's one of those protective measures that you're allowed to take. So there are more serious protective measures. Maybe you think, wow, mom's, mom's not really there herself either. Or maybe this guy has no family or trusted friends that can really help him. So now I'm faced with the concern that this guy really needs maybe a legal representative for himself. So that's got to be through a formal appointment. And now I'm going to have to reveal some information that my client might not want me to reveal. When you look at the rules in the comments, it's clear that you are able to reveal information. If you are looking to take, a, to take protective action for a client with diminished capacity, you can reveal information that he might not want you to reveal. But you can do that and you're protected. You have the ability to do that. Now, does that mean you can lay out, lay it all out in eight pages of um, a motion to the judge? Probably not. You've got to be very conservative. You've still got to look to um, mitigate the negative consequences to your client. Um, yes? Would you think if you're concerned about that, that's and determining how this would affect his overall or her overall case, what to do with the cameras? Uh, camera? With the judge? I think you could probably um, limit that exposure both by limiting, putting what your concerns are in writing to the judge and having it in, judge, uh, in camera. But if those are transcribed, which in Colorado they are, are they here? If you have an in camera um, discussion with the judge, are those part of the record that's reviewable? I think that's the. Pardon me? Okay, all right. So um, maybe that's one of the protective measures you can take. You, you have a lot of flexibility in what you can do for this client, and there's a lot of good options. I love the family member option if you've got, um, but occasionally you're gonna be in a situation where that's just not gonna be enough, and then you're really gonna have to ask yourself, what am I gonna do? Trust me, as soon as you raise the issue, your client is your enemy now. What do you mean I can't understand you? What are you calling me dumb? I'm perfectly able to follow this. I don't want you telling them I'm an alcoholic because what if he's an alcoholic and he just comes to every single meeting drunk? That's the same thing. His capacity is diminished. So now what do you do? Um, and, and the rules allow you to make uh, choices, including doing nothing at that point. Yes? some advice. 
But I agree with you, I think it's difficult, but I think there are some things that you probably could do to protect yourself in that regard. I think you could take very good notes about the kind of conversations you have with your client. I think you could take both sort of pre-giving him information and post-giving him information. There are a lot of areas of the law that also um, deal with capacity. Uh, Will's trust in the states is a great one. If you know a trust in the states lawyer, they have to do, they have to consider capacity all of the time. So maybe you align with them and say, is it possible for you to help me um, make this decision? Again, you're taking remedial action there, you're taking protective action. Um, so you want to be cautious about even that piece. And, and I think it's difficult. Uh, um, I would suggest taking very good notes and uh, putting everything you can in writing and um, doing everything you can to sort of say, here's, here's what I've done for this client. Um, and here's why I reached this conclusion. So, oh, all right, okay, excellent. I had a lot more for you all. I'm happy to stay late. <laughs> and I know all of you would want to stay late. So, yeah, right. so thank you all. That uh, concludes our 14th annual forum. Uh, thank you all for coming. Please don't forget to turn in your surveys. And again, your CLA certificates will be emailed to you, and we look forward to seeing you next year.